I just want to remind everybody that um, you are muted. If you have any questions, can you please put them in the Q&A chat box? Um, today we will be talking about breaking down the stigma and it starts with our language. This will be presented by Tosha Two Hearts, the Director of Community Behavioral Health and Amanda Flores, connecting with our Youth Program Manager. And I will go ahead and turn it over to you ladies. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So before we begin, we just want to open up our presentation in a good way. And um, I'm just going to ask for just uh, about a 30 second moment of silence for everybody in our community, everybody in the world uh, that is suffering in this moment. And um, there's this beautiful Lakota prayer that I wanted to share with you today before we begin. Waka, Tonka, great mystery, teach me how to trust my heart, my mind, my intuition, my inner knowing, the senses of my body, the blessings of my spirit. Teach me to trust these things so that I may enter my sacred space and love beyond my fear and thus walk in balance with the passing of each glorious sun. Thank you. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tosha now, and she's going to introduce herself and the programs we have here. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Betty Washte. Um, I'm Tosha Tuhart. I am the Director of Community Behavioral Health here at Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board. Um, I am also the director of our Great Plains Native Connections program, which is a youth suicide prevention program based uh, on the Crow Creek Sioux Reservation. Um, we also uh, have a Great Plains Tribal Opioid Response program, and right now we have a project that we're finishing up with the Santee Sioux Nation, and we just started a a new project with the Rabbit City area American Indian population and uh, with the Crow Creek Sioux tribe. Um, Amanda and I are both a part of the Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board staff intimate partner violence missing and murdered indigenous women's task force and I'll let Amanda continue. <clears throat> Yeah, and then um, we also have the the connecting with our youth Techa Kichi Okijupi program um, that's offered here in our Rapid City Hesapa area. Uh, we serve 10 to 24 year old Native American youth in the area who um, are just struggling with the day to day. So um, we have that program that's also available to our urban community here. All right, so. We're going to go ahead and get started here. And um, so Tosha and, Tosha and I were delighted to um, be able to present today. Um, and Good Health and Wellness had offered this opportunity to us. So we were very pleased to take on this opportunity, um, especially in this time of you know, this pandemic where people are really struggling and suffering um, throughout you know, our nation. So we thought it was really important to really touch today on the importance of language. And, um, you know, our language, it's critical. Um, and we need to all make sure that we're playing our part and we're being mindful of using the correct language. And so um, we're really going to touch on that today. Um, and, you know, our language reinforces so much and we want to promote, promote empowerment and strength within our community and um, we need to do that all together and each of us plays a part in that. So people are not cases or illnesses to be managed, right? So um, I just wanted to make that clear in the beginning. And so next slide, please. 
And so this is a really kind of interesting, but good clip here, uh, not helpful advice here. So um, this is, uh, you know, something that comes from, you know, making sure we're treating mental illness, um, though it's also a physical illness too. Um, so if you can read that, it's, I get that you have food poisoning and all, but you have to at least make an effort. Um, so you just need to change your frame of mind, then you'll feel better. So this is kind of an interesting little clip here that we wanted to share. Next. So we started off with some kind of negative uh, stigmatized words that we often hear. Uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody's can say safely that they haven't used any of these in their lifetime. So stigmatized words like, you know, psycho, bipolar, weak, dramatic, attention seeking, health, unhelpful phrases, right? Snap out of it. Other people have it worse. You'll feel better tomorrow. So those are actually really unhelpful phrases and stigmatized words that we just really need to work harder at not using. Um, so I wanted to see, are, do we have the option of, of opening up anybody that has any additional ones that they want to throw out there and share, or maybe you could throw it in the chat? Yeah, you can um, type anything in the chat. Um, also, if you would like to be unmuted, you can um, use the raise your hand um, icon and um, we can unmute you. Just go ahead and throw them out there. I know you have them. I will say it's it's sadly, you know, these these stigmatized words were, which is really unfortunate. Okay, that's all right. This too will pass. Yes, I've heard that one too many times. Thank you, Carlos. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to some more positive words here. So of course, the appropriate words and helpful phrases, um, looking back at, you know, what I mentioned earlier about strength-based roles. Um, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a doctor, I'm a nurse, I'm a teacher, I'm a sister. Those are strength-based Base roles that um, we really wanted to plug in here. And, you know, you're not your mental illness, right? People living with mental a mental health condition. I'm a person in recovery. I'm a person who loves. I'm a person who, you know, there, it could just go on to so many different directions, but making sure we're really um, addressing appropriate words and helpful phrases. Is there any other strength-based or appropriate words and helpful phrases that anybody wants to share? There's got to be one. <laughs> it's okay. I'm sure you'll think of them. Okay, so yeah, next please. So we really wanted to um, make sure, you know, we touch on our LGBTQ and Two-Spirit community. Um, you know, often stigmatized in so many different levels. And um, so our LGBTQ is an acronym for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer or questioning and then we have two-spirit um, so these are terms used to just describe our person's sexual orientation our gender identity and um, I wanted to just kind of share a little bit more about what questioning is because some might not be too familiar with that but um, sometimes when Q is seen as at the end of LGBT 
it's also it's also could mean questioning. So this term describes someone who is questioning their sexual orientation or gender identity. And then we also have two spirit. So a few months ago, we had a good um, friend and consultant from Tate Topo Consulting, Lenny Hayes, present on our two spirit community. And uh, I do have access to a PowerPoint that he presented to us. So if anybody's interested, you can reach out and I can send that to you um, later. So uh, just to kind of give you an idea of the two spirits. So a direct, it, so this comes from a direct translation of the Ojibwe. So the terms two-spirited or two-spirit is usually used to indicate a person whose body simultaneously houses a masculine spirit and a feminine spirit. So male two-spirits were considered to be a third gender and female two-spirits were considered to be a fourth gender. So the term two-spirit emerged in uh, 1990 at the third annual Intertribal Native American First Nations Gay Lesbian Conference in Winnipeg. Um, and then one of the things I wanted to make sure that's noted here is um, the genders vary from tribe to tribe but are similar and it is important to remember that the term two-spirit is a Native American concept and should only be used by Native Americans who identify. And um, and I love this little picture here because I think all of us have heard not a phase or yeah, not, or it's just a phase, right? It's just a phase. And um, I thought that was pretty ideal here. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Tosha. Thank you, Amanda. So um, going back to talking about how we, how language makes a huge impact on how we talk about things. I wanted to talk a little bit about our language around suicide. So um, I have this table. Um, so when we do talk about um, suicide, it's, it's best that we don't say unsuccessful or successful, but rather um, taken their own life, died by suicide, um, or if um, they didn't die by suicide, um, an attempt um, or non-fatal. And the reason why we say that is because it, when we use the word successful or unsuccessful, it's almost, it's like you're, they didn't succeed at something and that's almost like, um, it's almost like they're bad that it's bad that they didn't succeed. So it, it's good that we stay away from that type of language, like a de, de, as it says, like a desired outcome. Um, <clears throat> using committed or committed suicide is also something we want to avoid. Um, that tends to associate it with a crime or a sin. Um, it has a negative connotation that folks um, have. Um, control or it's it, it's that's not good and I always look at like um, mental health um, I always look at it compared to physical health you can't commit terminal cancer you can't commit um, things that are going on with your body that you really don't have control over in the moment or when it's happening and um, suicide and mental illness is no different you can manage, you can take care of yourself just like with physical health, but um, we can't hold that blaming um, type of mentality when someone's in crisis or when these things happen. Um, concerning rates of suicide versus suicide epidemic, um, we want to try to s avoid sensationalizing or um, making the death and the, the death a uh, focus. When we do talk about um, individuals who um, have died by suicide, it's important to shift away from the cause of death, but the idea that this was an individual that passed away. Um, and there are like, there are actual like media kits out there that help folks um, use more sensitive and appropriate language. And 
And so <clears throat> going to language and um, we, so with connecting with our youth and our programs at Great Plains, we try to um, go back to healing and using positive um, cultural practices to heal our historical trauma and the things that really are a root cause of all of our a lot of our public health um, concerns now and so uh, um, with connecting with our youth um, that the program has uh, you they use kinship terms we refer to each other um, through kinship words um, <clears throat> so with children, in the center, um, the youth are surrounded by their family. And this is like the old um, traditional Lakota way of um, how youth were taken care of and how society operated. So we have Tiwahe, which is your immediate family. Um, <clears throat> we have like medicine or holy men in chief, which is or Itracha, um, Unchi and Gaka or Chunkashila, um, which is grandma and grandpa, uncle and aunt, um, like she um, or Tumi, and even like your cousins, um, Shicheshi and Jepkashi. Um, and there are a lot of other word, Lakota words in it. it <laughs> I won't uh, give a Lakota lesson in this presentation, but there's female. Um, there's even words for friends, deep friends, mentors, peers. So um, in those spaces with connecting with our youth, we address each other in relation because we, um, we look at the Lakota philosophy of being a good relative. So when we look at each other and we address each other, we address each other by our relationship to each other. Um, and then looking at contemporary times, um, we have all um, society and family and those networks of support look a lot differently for our youth. Um, you know, we have schools, so um, youth have their peers and um, their teachers um, are connecting with our youth program, other programs. Um, juvenile, the juvenile system, their grandparents, a lot of time youth are taken care of by their grandparents, um, either solely or in addition to um, their parents, and then social services, foster care. Even though we're in contemporary times, it's important to keep that relational piece. Um, just because we're in different spaces doesn't mean we can't still look to each other as good relatives and take care of each other and address each other in that positive way. Now I'll give it back to Amanda. Yeah, so we thought it was really important um, to also share a little bit about, you know, the difference of cultural humility versus culturally competent. It's definitely something that a lot of our um, mentors in our programs that have really um, enlightened us on as, as we're um, navigating through, through this world. So um, I love the concept of cultural humility. I, I will say it's, it's rather new to me and I didn't, um, I didn't really grasp onto it until about a year ago. And I, you know, I and Tosha are really a firm believer in humility versus competent. And so just a couple, um, uh, you know, sort of bullet points on humility is, this, it's this lifelong commitment to self-evaluate. Um, it's this process of self-awareness and reflection. So you're constantly reflecting on, uh, you know, what you're doing, what you could do better, um, being self-aware of how you're, you're perceived, how you're, how you're listening, you know, so many different, um, you know, avenues in the, pro the process of self-awareness and reflection. And then, you know, addressing that power imbalance, which is really big, I think, um, in our community and communities is there is, there's a power imbalance. And I think that oftentimes that's where it really starts. Um, 
is is addressing that at the forefront and and realizing that we're all here to work together and so um, and then of course it requires attitude and openness and egolessness um, right that's a really big thing there and um, you know comp I'm not saying competency is is bad in any way I mean competency is also um, a you know learning a learning opportunity for everybody but um, it, you know I, I think humility really kind of speaks more volumes if if we're going to create this this community of healing and so we wanted to definitely make sure that we shared more on cultural humility for you thank you next slide and of course some resources uh, there's the free training the importance of first person language here uh, that's a really good training and then we have our suicide prevention term glossary words matter terms to use and avoid when talking about addiction and then our um, website at Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board, the behavioral health section also has some good uh, resources on our programs. So if you're interested in learning more about each of our programs, you can find that on our website or you can contact Tosha and I. But um, I think now we just wanted to open it up for any questions, uh, feedback, comments. Um, well, hi, thanks so much to you guys for your presentation. I um, wrote down two things that I really loved. I loved the idea of strength based based roles, um, because I really feel like that can work for anyone, you know, um, some of those the I don't know if it was a slide before with, you know, those those negative terms and the negative connotations, you're still able to um, just those strength-based roles that anybody can use those and anyone can develop them for a family member to really help change and shift the way that person may feel about themselves. So I think that's really neat. Um, and then I also love the cultural humility versus cultural, cultural competency. And um, thank you for explaining that, that they really are very different things um, and maybe um, you know, we start instead of saying cultural competency, we also say, or we just include both when people um, ask to learn more or, you know, when there's like the cultural competency, competency training or something, we also incorporate the cultural humility. So I think there's um, definitely some things that we can grow from there. So thank you. Thanks, Jen. Tosha, I think you were mentioning too um, the, the like mental health first aid to kind of touched a little bit on sort of all these stigmatized words and then there's an activity where you uh, come up with all these you know stigmatized words and then you come up with positive and then you tear it up which is really you yeah. know sort of a good way of um, representing that um, and I should have had you all uh, write down on a piece of paper and then tear it up but you could you could do that <laughs> later <laughs> any other questions or comments yeah and just a reminder you can use the q a box or um, if you'd like to um, be unmuted you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you if you have questions I think Tosha, did you mention there's like toolkits out there that that can be shared for to help kind of shift the use of the language? Yeah, so um, on the resources page. So I really enjoyed um, SMI advisor, um, their online training called the importance of first person language. Okay. And so that that really teaches you how to shift 
from, for example, calling someone an addict or schizophrenic to um, a person um, living with a substance use disorder or a person um, living with a mental um, health illness. Um, so it's like shifting shifting that mindset and how to like talk about these things. There's a lot of different um, stuff out there. I was mentioning there's a, there's, there are um, media kits for how folks can write about like suicide. But we also, <clears throat> if you want to know like the, the terms around suicide prevention, um, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center has a great glossary about that. Um, there, there's just like tons of resources you can look up out there on like um, better language. And there are people who like have discussions on what's a preferred lang what's preferred language or not like right now. Um, there's a lot of op different um, opinions on whether folks who've gone through domestic violence or who are going through it should be called victims or survivors. And so people, there's so many different opinions on that. I wanted to add it here, but I, um, there isn't really a consensus on what are the best terms for that. And then words matter. I, I really like this little glossary. I think I saw a notification somewhere on this. There was a comment in the chat about um, sharing the slides afterwards, which um, we will be sending out a follow up email, um, which will have the link to this recording. And then um, if our presenters are willing, we can also share these slides in that follow up email as well. Awesome. Will do. Great. Well, if there are no other questions, um, thank you so much, Amanda and Tosha, for presenting on our community health webinar series. Um, there is an evaluation feedback form in the chat box. Um, if you can please take a minute to fill that out um, and, and give us some ideas for any um, upcoming webinars and topics that you would like to hear about. Um, and yeah, look out for that follow up email. It'll have the recording and the um, slides attached. So thank you everyone for joining today um, and we hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Tosha and Amanda.